Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to another weekly reading vlog. I have literally nothing to report because, as usual, this is filmed five seconds after I filmed the outro to my last one. But it's just so that I've got an intro because sometimes I forget to do an intro. Let's do this. I'm watching the girl with all the gifts, which counts as buckish because it's based on a novel. I actually interviewed the author. And uh, I made vegan spag bowl. Look at that. <laughs> Look at him. He's gone out of focus. Really being such a cutie, eh? Hey. I've been photographing some books I'm going to be selling on eBay. I'm starting up an eBay bookstore. Yep. Link below. This is the biggest veggie burger I've ever made, I think. Oh man, I'm so tired. I've also just realised I left. Well, I've put some of the books away I need to talk about. Oh, and I got dizzy from standing up too quickly as well. That's never good. All right, I might have missed the Penguin Little Black Classic here because I, basically I filmed my wrap-up earlier and I've been um, working ahead, so I've been filming ahead, uh, you know, the first half of my wrap-up. Oh, now I'm on low battery and no low space. I'll come back and do this in a later time. Oh, man, I'm so tired. I've spent, like, the last three days straight, pretty much, working and cleaning, but the flat is nearly clean now. I'm going to give you a quick update. It's currently ten past midnight so that's why i'm being relatively quiet so it's just started friday morning uh i will we'll go to bed soon i promise um this friday evening bex is coming over and staying here then saturday we're going into london to meet up with her brother going to meet her mum and then going to her dad's for her dad's birthday we'll stay over there in leon c on saturday night sunday we're coming back here staying here and then monday i'm off to oxford because i have a meeting with a client so i'll go back to oxford with her meet my client and then work from hers stay over Monday night and come back Tuesday and then have a driving lesson so it's all going to be go go but uh, I thought I'd quickly uh, oh also on top of all that I've also been doing loads of filming as well but uh, this is the last bit I have to update you on now so this is my vlog so here we have Leo Tolstoy how much how much land does a man need number 57 a parable of a, a parable of a Russian peasant's bargain with the devil considered by James Joyce to be the world's greatest story and this was excellent I really enjoyed it I've discovered I may in fact be a Tolstoy fan now this is the first of his work that I've Enjoy, uh, read and I really enjoy it like I said I gave this a 4.5 out of 5 actually and I kind of agree with James Joyce there um, so now I want to read more Tolstoy but uh, certainly with short stories he's fantastic and I think the quality of the uh, the translation here helped as well then we have Richard Hackloyd the voyage of Sir Francis Drake around the whole globe and uh, so this has it has the famous voyage of Sir Francis Drake into the South Sea and there hence about the whole globe of the earth begun in the year of our Lord 1577 and the prosperous voyage of the worshipful Thomas Candish of Trimley in the county of Suffolk Esquire into the South Sea and from thence round about the circumference of the whole earth begun in the year of our Lord 1586 and finished 1588 and this is obviously written in sort of old English so I'm going to read you a paragraph here to give you a feel for it. The seven day between the mouth of the straits and the narrowest place thereof, we took a Spaniard whose name was Hernando, who was there with 23 Spaniards more, which were all that remained of 400, which were left there three years before in these straits of Magellan, all the rest being dead with famine, and the same day we passed through the narrow narrowest of the straits. You can tell I'm tired because I can't read. But um, yeah, I thought it was quite interesting. I wasn't expecting there to be as much like raping and pillaging, to be honest. But yeah, I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5. I did find it quite hard going with the writing style, but at the same time, I thought it kind of added quite a lot to read it in that uh, original kind of written sort of old English as well. So that was cool. I may have actually already updated you about that one. I'm not sure. I kind of lost track of which mid uh, penguin little black classics i've read during this period because i've just filmed my wrap up as well kind of filming that in advance and so i've just talked about these books a couple of hours ago but i foolishly put the penguin books away and i don't have a record on me of which ones i read but we're going with that all right then i read tilly and the wall by leo leone and this is literally about uh, a small mouse well a group of mice and they discover a, a way to burrow under a wall and they can come out the other side and go about their business. And that's basically the plot of this. It's a little kid's book. Leone is like a classic children's author as well. I think he was like he died when he was like 82, about 10, 15 years ago. Um, but I actually wanted to get this book because there's a band I like called Tilly and the Wall and they take their name from the book. And yeah, it was it was good. I mean, I'm not a child, so I don't know, but I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. Okay, then we have How It Works, The Mum by J.A. Aisley and J.C. Morris or JP Morris and uh, this is basically like a ladybird book for adults talking about mums so I'm going to read you some extracts here 
Alice is a successful biochemist. She publishes at least one highly regarded academic paper a year and has won the Colworth Medal. At the school gate, nobody knows this. Alice does not even have a name. Everyone calls her Olivia's mum. Olivia has not done anything yet. So yeah, <laughs> brutally truthful there. Sophie's son Ted has invited some friends around for a birthday tea. Afterwards, Sophie finishes the children's leftovers. She is so full of ham, carrot sticks, pita bread, dips and cake that she cannot bend over. When Ted's dad comes home with a takeaway curry, Sophie puts on her what a lovely surprise face and pretends to be ill. And I also read How It Works, The Sister. Both of these are 3.5 out of 5 because they are what they are, but I do like these books, you know, I'm trying to collect them all. I don't know why you can't be nice to your little brother, says Maggie's mum. We all have to get along in this family. Maggie has never met her Uncle Pete because her mum pretends he lives in New Zealand. Again, quite like relatable. Lottie and Morgan share so many memories of growing up together. Now they are older, they often talk about all the things they did. Did not, says Lottie. Did, says Morgan. Did not, says Lottie. Did, says Morgan. Did not, says Lottie. So yeah, we have those. Then we have John Wyndham, The Day of the Triffids. Uh, and I'll be doing a fuller review of this for my wrap-up for the My Cat uh, Chooses My TBR video. But um, basically, a few people on BookTube as well saw that I was reading this and were kind of keen to see what I made of it and see whether I recommend it. I would recommend it. It's basically like ecological, post-apocalyptic, survival thriller horror, basically. Uh, the Triffids are these sort of semi-intelligent plants. They're, uh, they can attack people. They're poisonous. They have barbs and stings and stuff. Uh, a lot of people are blind as well because basically this com comet came and if you looked at the comet, it sent you blind. Our main character actually woke up in the hospital. Um, he'd had an operation on his eyes I believe and so he's actually one of the lucky few who can see but then we sort of see how society deals with that so we have like these kind of compounds of survivors and uh, you know they'll assign it so it's one sighted person for every 10 blind and that sort of thing we also have the idea of how we're gonna rebuild society especially with we have all this knowledge in books but books assume that you have a certain amount of background knowledge already so even farming can be a challenge if you're not a farmer um, yeah I read it as a bedtime book so I read it 25 pages pages at a time and I think that helped with it as well because it did get slow from time to time but reading it in those chunks definitely helped me to enjoy it more. I gave this a 3.75 out of 5 and yes I would recommend it especially if you're into sort of post-apocalyptic and that sort of stuff. And now I'm reading Peter James Not Dead Enough and I'm on page 524 of about 620 so I'm getting near the end now as you can see. I've been reading this for sort of three four days now although I did sort of read those other books as well and um Basically, the, there's a guy in this who's the suspect of this crime, and uh, it looks as though potentially maybe he has a twin who might be imitating him, um, but it means they're kind of taking out insurance policies and his wife under his name and all this stuff. It's getting very sort of intense. I'll read you the blurb, actually. On the night Brian Bishop murdered his wife, he was 60 miles away, asleep in bed at the time. At least that's the way it looks to Detective Superintendent Roy Grace, who was called in to investigate the kinky slaying of beautiful socialite Katie Bishop. Grace soon starts coming to the conclusion that Bishop has performed the apparently impossible feat of being in two places at once. Has someone stolen his identity or is he simply a very clever liar? As Grace digs deeper behind the facade of the Bishop's outwardly respectable lives, it becomes clear that everything is not at all as it first seemed. Then he digs just a little too far and suddenly the fragile stability of his own troubled private world is facing destruction. So yeah. Uh, about 100 pages away from the end. Really enjoying it so far. It's another one of the Roy Grace novels. I haven't been read reading them in order, which kind of I probably should do, and I would recommend reading them in order. But still, I am enjoying this so far, and I will give you an update soon on what I thought of it at the end, because the ending could change it a lot. Whew. All right, and as you can tell from my voice, it is gone because I've filmed, I was probably filmed for two hours today. Uh, I've got some editing I'm going to go and do as well, and I'm also going to try and finish off the cleaning before I go to bed. So, yeah. All right. Head back tomorrow, and then um, gonna stay over and home tomorrow night. Yeah.
donuts. Huh? what I call a vegan hot dog. Look at that. Take that, Isis. <laughs> mm. that now says I'm saying that again. <laughs> I meant Isis Tavern. Peanut butter and Nutella. Mm -hmm. Good cookies. Casually listening to Tchaikovsky as you do. Gets quite loud this. Basically my missus is into uh, vinyls. Well her and her housemates have got a big old collection so I thought I'd start my own as well. Uh, what have we got here? We have, uh, these are lots of singles. This one is uh, Saturday Night at the Movies by The Drifters. Uh, here we have UB40, Cherryo Baby, Johnny Remember Me, John Layton, what a banger. The Locomotion, Little Eva. Oh here we go, here's my chubby checker, The Twist. And it confuses me that Let's Twist Again is the A side and The Twist is the B side. That makes no sense. Uh, anyway, I should give you an update. I haven't filmed for a few days. To be honest, my mental health's been pretty bad um, for like three days in a row. It's kind of getting a little better now, so that's good. Um, but I have been kind of productive. Work has been insane. Uh, it's Wednesday so far, and I've already done a week's worth of work, and I'm still doing more um, just to try and keep on top of things, really. It's just been super stressful. Um, but yeah, so uh, I went to Bex's parents' place for her dad's birthday and we played some badminton, so you've seen that. And then we travelled back to Oxford because I had a meeting in Oxford, stayed there, came back here yesterday on the Tuesday and uh, yeah, then this weekend I'm going away as well. I'm going glamping, um, which should be nice. So I'm going to update you on some books and then uh, I guess I'm going to love you and leave you for this vlog. So we'll start with the little ones. Uh, some more of the Penguin Little Black Classics, which by the way, I only have six left to read now. So here we have The Nose by Nikolai Gogol. Number 46, uh, Russia's great 19th century satirical absurdist shows what happens when a man wakes up with his nose missing and illustrates the folly of boasting. So, I'm reasonably sure <laughs> that, see this confused me because I read this and I was like, how is he illustrating the folly of boasting with this nose story? No, that's what he does in the second story in this collection called The Carriage, which is fine, it's just, you know, it, it, it kind of doesn't, it doesn't clear, clarify that on, on the blurb, but um, yeah, The Nose was fantastic. That, as a short story, was a 4.75 out of 5, damn near perfect. And then The Carriage was okay. I gave this, as a whole, I gave this a 4 out of 5, but I've never read any Goggle before. And yeah, it's like surreal shit, really, but yeah, really well written, very entertaining as well. Like The Nose, I thought that was great, but like, again, this guy loses his nose. He's actually quite an important chap as well. And so he's like trying to find it and he wants to put like an advert in the papers and they're like, no, you can't do that. That's weird. And uh, so yeah, I would heartily recommend that one. I want to read some more Gogol. All right, then we have Samuel Pepys, The Great Fire of London at number 47. Originally written in code, Pepys' diary includes his unforgettable eyewitness account of the 1666 fire. So this basically has extracts from both 1666 to do with the fire of London and 1665 to do with the plague. Uh, people actually quite often say that it was the fire of London that kind of helped chase off the plague. It had already been on kind of on the wane by that point, but um, the fire sort of got rid of the last, the last bastions of plaguehood, I guess. Now what's interesting as well is that I knew, uh, I'd heard the fact that uh, Peeps buried his cheese to, uh, to avoid the fire. Yes, he buried his cheese. It turns out he wrote about it in his diary. He buried his cheese, which I believe was Parmesan cheese, and his wine as well. He buried them both, thinking that if the fire came, they'd be uh, undamaged. It was also interesting to read about people. You know, people were moving stuff from one house to another. They were moving it to, just, you know, their possessions to, say, the brother's house, in case the fire took, you know, caught, in case the fire caught the house. And then the fire spread, and then they'd have to move again, and again, and again. And, uh, I mean, it's just amazing. I think only, one person or two people died? Hey Google, how many people died in the Great Fire of London? 
So yeah, Google says that 70,000 of the 80,000 people living in the city lost their homes in the fire, but only six people died. So, you know, small blessings, I guess. Uh, the, the plague was obviously a lot more deadly. Uh, but yeah, really fascinating. I mean, I've read Journal of the Plague Year by Daniel Defoe as well, which was kind of, I think he wrote it a little bit after the plague. It's almost fiction slash non-fiction. We actually had a lot of debates at uni about which to call it. Um, but yeah, I, I find reading about the plague and the Great Fire pretty interesting. Uh, Peeps is like, obviously it's written as a diary and also in Old English, so it's not always the easiest to follow. Let me read you this entry from the 29th of June, 1665. Up and by water to Whitehall, where the court full of wagons and people ready to go out of town. The mortality bill has come to 267, which is about 90 more than the last, and of these but four in the city, which is a great blessing to us. So home, calling at Somerset House, where all are packing up too. The Queen Mother setting out for France this day to drink Bourbon waters this year, she being in a consumption, and intends not to come till winter come 12 months. To the office, where busy a while, putting some things in my office in order, and then to letters till night. About 10 o'clock home, the days being sensibly shorter. Before, I have once kept a summer's day by shutting up office by daylight, but my life hath been still as it was in winter almost. But I will for a month try what I can do by daylight. So home to supper and to bed. He was also in charge of the Navy at the time as well, so there's a lot of stuff about the Dutch, because I guess the Brits were at war with the Dutch at the time, so uh, I like the Dutch, so, you know, yeah, go Dutchies. Anyway, here we go. Uh, yeah, Great Fire of London gave that... Uh, 4.25 out of 5, really interesting. Um, yeah, I would recommend reading that actually. I might even be up for reading Peeps' full diaries at some point. I don't know, it depends how long they were. But that little 50 to 60 page sample, quite a lot of fun. All right, here we have Plato, Socrates' defense, number 52. Sentenced to death for corrupting the youth of ancient Athens, Socrates, Plato's teacher, founded Western philosophy. And I believe it goes, so Socrates taught Plato Plato taught Aristotle, and Aristotle taught Alexander the Great. I think that's the, the order that that goes in, uh, which is very interesting. Now, Plato basically, again, he'd been accused of corrupting the youth, and this is his argument, like he stood up in court knowing he faced death, and he basically, it's quite hard to say how he defended himself, because he did it in a lot of different ways, to be fair, but I thought it was a pretty convincing uh, defense that he gave, but obviously it's one of those where they'd already determined they were gonna put him to death. And we have some quite touching bits. So, uh, yes, yeah, spoiler alert, he was indeed sentenced to death. I mean, I don't know if you need spoiler alerts for things happening, you know, years and years ago. Uh, but uh, he also, th then we've got Plato, who's obviously really idolizes this man, really looks up to him, and is writing about his final words. And it's just very sort of poignant and very moving. And also just the folly of, of, of killing somebody who is now claimed as one of the greatest philosophers of all time and they killed him for corrupting people because basically I mean you need to read like Plato's Republic and stuff to get a thorough background into why why he why the things he said were a little bit controversial but um and I haven't read that but he, I mean it's covered in his defense to a, a, a lesser extent as well uh, but yeah I'm gonna read this out to you great translation by the way so the sentence of death is approved Socrates addresses the court for the final time You'll not have bought a lot of time at this price, men of Athens, getting the name from anyone who wants to abuse the city for being the ones who killed off Socrates, a wise man. People who want to find fault with Athens will of course say that I'm wise, even if I'm not. At any rate, if you'd waited a little time, you'd have had the same outcome without doing anything. You can see my age for yourselves, how far on I am in life, how near to death. I say this not to all of you, just to those of you who voted to put me to death. And I've got something else to say to these people. You probably imagine, Athenians, that I stand condemned because I lack the sorts of arguments with which I could have persuaded you, given always that I supposed I should do and say everything to escape the penalty. Far from it. If I've been condemned for the lack of something, it's not the lack of arguments, but a lack of effrontery and shamelessness, and the willingness to address you in the sorts of ways that it'd please you most to hear. Wailing and lamenting and doing and saying plenty of other things unworthy of me, as I claim, even if they're the sort of things you're used to hearing from everyone else. I didn't think then that I should do anything unworthy of a free man, despite the danger I face, nor do I now regret having made my defence as I did. I'd far rather make that defence and die than demean myself and live. No one, whether it's in court or in war, whether it's myself or anyone else, should try to escape death by any means he can devise. In battles, the opportunity is often there to avoid death by throwing away one's arms or turning to supplicate one's pursuers, and there are other devices for avoiding death in every sort of danger, if only one has the face to do and say anything no matter what. But I hazard, Athenians, that the difficult thing is not to avoid death, more difficult is avoiding viciousness, because viciousness is a faster runner than death. So now, because I'm so slow and old, I've been caught by the slower runner, but because they're so quick and clever, my accusers have been caught by the quicker one. And if I'm going to leave the court condemned by you to death, they will leave it convicted by truth of depravity and injustice. They accept their penalty as I do mine. 
I suppose it's probably how it had to be, and I think it's a fair result. So yeah, really good stuff in here, lots of food for thought. 4.5 out of 5, one of my favourites actually of, uh, of the box set. Okay, so that brings us on to the two beasts here. So we have Not Dead Enough by Peter James. Uh, on, uh, on the night Brian Bishop murdered his wife, he was 60 miles away, asleep in bed at the time. At least that's the way it looks to Detective Superintendent Roy Grace. So this is obviously one of Peter James's Roy Grace novels. It's actually only the third in the series, uh, and I've kind of read further on. And you can read these as standalones, but if you read them in order, you get more in terms of, you know, the background stories and what's happening to the other people on his team. Uh, so there are loads of characters in this that I know that later on they're dead or in jail or whatever, you know. But I did still enjoy it. I didn't think it was his best. I think it gets better as time goes on, uh, which isn't really surprising, you know. Uh, this is a bit of a chunker as well, about 640 pages, but um, enjoyable enough. Uh, probably not my favourite of his. I gave it 3.75 out of 5. I would recommend reading the Roy Grace series, but you could also just do what I do and just, you know, get them second hand when you see them and read them out of order. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it was, it was alright. And a fun fact about Peter James, his mum used to be the official glove maker for Queen Elizabeth II. So there we go. Alright, and finally, this is what I read on my way to and from Leon, Leon C and in my travels around Oxford and stuff. So Nosferatu by Joe Hill. I know in America this is Nosferatu because Americans say the word differently than British people. And I believe it's actually like a European word as well. So we probably both say it wrong. So there is some comfort in that, I guess. And uh, yeah, Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. This is basically about a place called Christmas Land. There's a guy called Charlie Manx who's a bit like a vampire, but also a bit not. He has this uh, haunted Rolls Royce Wraith called um, with the number plate Nosferatu and basically him and the car are one and the same and what he does is he kind of takes kids away that are being abused by their parents or whose parents aren't you know good to them and they go back to Christmas land and the car and him they like absorb all of the negativity from them but then it kind of leaves these kids as like dried out husks uh, so it's yeah it's interesting it's kind of a built on a build on the uh, you know traditional vampire myth and you know these kids are a bit like vampire thralls and that sort of thing and we follow uh, a main character called uh, Victoria McQueen who basically her kid is taken by Charlie Manx well first of all she's taken and then the kid is taken as well and um, yeah I don't think that's too much of a spoiler to say because, it, yeah, it does say here, only one kid ever escaped Charlie Manx, Vic McQueen. But the end of that nightmare was just the beginning of their life and death battle of wills. A battle that explodes a quarter century later. Because now Manx has taken Vic's son. And Vic McQueen is going to get him back or die trying. Now that takes us up to about 250 pages into the book. So that's a good third of it on, on the blurb. But again, I didn't mind it too much. I also like there was a tie-in with Stephen King stuff. Because uh, there was a, a reference to Pennywise and uh, Derry Maine as well. And yeah, there's some really good characters in this. Every character felt super well fleshed out. There was a bit of romance towards right at the end, which I didn't like. Um, basically, one of the characters ends up with another one of the characters. And it just didn't need to happen, I don't think. But hey-ho. And uh, there was also lots of, like, pr plenty, plenty of gore and violence and stuff. My, my favourite character in it died a pretty brutal death as well, which I thought was good, to be honest. Because as much as I like that character... She, she she outlived her purpose in the story, you know. I gave this a uh, 4 out of 5. I thought it was pretty good. It wasn't mind-blowing, and I actually preferred Heart Shaped Box, uh, which are the, these, these are the only two Joe Hill books I've read. But what I would say is if I'd read this without a cover and didn't know what it was, and I just read it and just judged it on the writing, I would have told you it was a Stephen King book. So that's quite interesting because I think in Heart Shaped Box, Hill's own style shines through, whereas in Nosferatu, I think he's definitely playing at being his dad, but it works. So, you know, yeah, cool. And I'm now on Dead Simple by Peter James, which is actually the very first one of these books. So it's getting even weirder now, because I haven't read this one. And like, people that I've read seven, eight books with those characters in are just getting introduced, which is, is kind of strange. And the uh, concept here is quite cool. Basically, a dude has been buried in a coffin as like a, as a stag night pl uh, prank before his wedding. And then the four dudes who buried him there are all killed in a car crash. And it's kind of this race against time thing. Actually reading it, I'm getting vibes like, I feel like I've read it before. But I checked, and I definitely haven't, so I don't know. But um, yeah, pretty good so far. It's on, on course, probably for a 4 out of 5. So yeah. Alright, and that brings me up to date, so I'm going to sign out of this week's vlog. So as always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Also, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. I forgot that bit. Alright, peace. I'm being watched by some people outside my house.